Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Seamus Khan, and I'm a professor of sociology and American studies at Princeton University. And today I'm delighted to welcome you all to an RSA online event. Thanks for joining us. I'm really pleased to have a chance to talk with the brilliant author, and actually, as it turns out, good friend of mine, Kathy O'Neill. Kathy's a mathematician as well as an author and has worked as a professor, a hedge fund analyst, a data scientist, and an occasional rabble rouser, as well as being a musician. She holds a PhD in mathematics from Harvard University and is the founder of the algorithmic accounting company, Orca. Kathy's also an author of several brilliant books. Um, uh, and today we're gonna talk about her latest uh, book, which I just had the pleasure of reading this weekend, The Shame Machine, Who Profits in the New Age of Humiliation? In it, she talks about the social, political, and commercial power of shame and how it's harvested by industries that prey on us and really sort of profit from producing this sentiment. In some ways, they're profiting from damages that they're doing to our communities and to ourselves. It's a fascinating exploration that weaves together social commentary and research with Kathy's own expertise on the internet, the power of algorithms, and her own personal experience. If those of you watching along would like to join the conversation about the event on Twitter, you're more than welcome to do so using the hashtag hashtag RSA shame, or just here in the YouTube chat function. Kathy, thanks so much today for joining us. It's great to be talking with you. Seamus, it's really my pleasure. It's great to see you. So I wondered if you could just start by bringing the audience into the book a little bit. Um, you know, you talk in other books of yours, drawing really on like your expertise as a data scientist and an algorithm expert, but in this one, you sort of open with a different um, approach. And in some ways it's deeply personal in how you open the book. So can you, can you just bring us in to, to, to this text? Sure. Um, it's a very open-ended question. So I get, I get a lot of leeway here. I will, yeah. I will tell you like <laughs> how I became fascinated by shame um, in mm -hmm. the first place. Um, on the one hand, I saw shame as and actually a sort of underlying power of some of the sort of terrible algorithms that I'd been researching. So I had interviewed teachers uh, who were being fired or denied tenure, which is tantamount to fired. Um, school teachers, like public high school teachers mostly, and principals, I'd been interviewing them about like the formulas by which they are being scored um, and fired. And I would be like, so did you ask them to explain your score? And the teachers would be like, no, they told me it, it was math and I wouldn't understand it. And at the time, I just remember being like, what? You know, like, what? That's outrageous. You know, if somebody told me it's math, you wouldn't understand it. I would be like, no, it's your problem if you can't explain it. Um, because it's my right to understand why I'm being fired, right? But like, but the fact that they didn't respond that way, number one, because they're not PhD mathematicians like me, I get it. But that's actually the point, right? That they they sort of were silenced. They were silenced by that response. And it wasn't one time, it was a systemic, it was the answer I got when I asked teachers this question and principals. So it was actually um, a, a sort of um, an actual strategy. And it was, it was a shaming strategy. It was like what maybe you could call it math shaming. But what was shocking to me was how much it worked, like how consistently it worked. I hope consistently the people were like, after that, I didn't ask any more questions. And I was like, that's fascinating because it's a terrible algorithm. Um, it should never have happened. It should have been audited, blah, blah, blah. I could talk about the statistical failures all, all day. But at the end of the day, the reason it worked on an individual level was that it, it, it prevented, like that shaming aspect prevented people from fighting for their own, right, their own rights. And I found that really weird. Yeah, I mean, and, I guess, oh, sorry. Yeah, no. no, go ahead. And I was just gonna say that I didn't get it, but then two years later when I was doing my own research, my own research on bariatric surgery, it happened to me. Um, and so that's when I got it. And, and it was like, actually that, that second moment where I realized, oh my God, this is happening to me. It's happening to me when I do Google searches on bariatric surgery, because it's like a weight loss surgery, even though I was going at it as a, um, diabetes prevention surgery, which it also is, it should be called that. Um, but it, it's not called that because it is just so profitable to fat shame people. And I was being fat shamed by the very kinds of digital advertisement that I used to 
I used to produce, you know, as a, I was an ad tech data scientist. Um, so I was like, I can understand this at a rational level, but I am like blown away by the shame I'm feeling and I can't think and I can't advocate for myself and I can't do this research that I know I should be able to do and like what's happening to me and I was like oh wait and I thought of those teachers and I was like oh my god I'm being shamed and I'm being shamed viscerally and am incapable of, of advocating for myself and that's the same thing that I was observing in these teachers and it's like a totally different context and then I was like oh this has nothing to do with formulas or you know science this is just this is a mechanism a social mechanism that silences and shames us and prevents us from and not only just prevents us from asking further questions it was like i would have paid any amount of money Seamus, like to get out that feeling out of my head if i thought yeah, it could I, work i mean i think you know in reading the book as a sociologist what i really thought about was how in many instances, not all of them, but in many instances, what you're sort of expressing is how our social failures become individualized and internalized. So, you know, um, you give examples, opening of like poverty or of drug addiction, right? And so in the poverty one, it's like poverty is a social failure, but it, instead of thinking of it as something that we collectively have failed at, we think about it as how individuals have failed and we shame them. And often people who are poor internalize that shame. Or when we look at drug addiction, there's a series of social failures. And you know, there's a failure of our society to do things to help people who struggle with addiction or that lead to conditions where they become addicts. And instead we sort of point and say, you're doing this wrong thing. And often people internalize this. But I think what pushes this so much further is that you note that it's not just that process, it's also how corporations or industries, entire industries profit of, 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 uh, by doing this. And so I'm curious, like what makes shame so profitable? Right, I mean, and, and you just covered like two aspects of shame. Um, one is like what we gain by shaming other people which is this notion of like distance, sort of psychological distance, like, oh, you, addicted people should be ashamed of themselves, i.e. I don't want to think that this, that this will happen to my kids or to me or to my loved ones. Oh, poor people should be ashamed of themselves. They should behave better, make better choices, i.e. I don't want to think about poverty being a possibility for me and or my loved ones. Um, but then there's the, the sort of flip side, which is what, what happens at, what's the experience of being shamed? Um, and I sort of got at that a little bit with my story about search, searching online for weight loss surgeries and the teachers. But the more general thing is, and I'll back up a little bit and define shame. Um, shame, as it's as it's experienced, is the sort of disintegration of your sense of self. It is like a real. It's a feeling like you are not lovable. Um, and you're, it, it, to be clear, it's not in, entirely your sense of self uh, altogether. It's your sense of a social self, like your ability to be loved, to be in a community um, and, and, and worthwhile in that community. It's extremely threatening. Um, and it, it makes sense that it's threatening because like historically, uh, and not just historically, but you can even see it happening right now in, in places like Kiev, like, there are things that you have to sacrifice. There are conflicts, like you want something, but the community needs you to do something else, like not hoarding food during a moment of scarcity, where if you don't, if you don't respond to the social cues and the social requirements, like you will be thrown out, you will be like castigated and possibly you will die, right? So the sh shame acts like as a way for, to sort of corral people into doing what's good for the community instead of just what's good for themselves. And the threat there is real. The threat is like, we will hate you if you don't, if you're not a good community member. So going back to, um, going back to like the, the notion, the questions you said, like the poverty shame and the, and the addiction shame, um, those, those are helpful for the people doing it because the people who are experiencing the shame, which often does happen, um, they are silenced. They, they really do feel like I've, I've done wrong, even when they're completely innocent, even when they're completely innocent, like 
like poor children, you know, like completely and there's no possible way that they could be at fault for being born. Um, and yet that, that shame acts as a way for them to be silenced and to bear to bear the shame. Similarly, when we are in a situation uh, of, of being targeted by shame in the, in the corporate setting, so I'll just throw out weight loss, which we've already brought up, but like most cosmetics or wellness situations, like, all, you know, basically, and this is a sort of traditionally female targeted um, set of industries, like to make women feel unattractive, therefore buy a product. It, it works because we, we feel ashamed of the way we look and, and that's such a threat to ourselves it's sort of hijacking that 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 sort of evolutionary useful thing and just making us feel like i i desperately need to conform to this notion of acceptable you know beauty or looks anyway and i will do literally anything to get there because otherwise i feel very threatened and that means if that means money if that means buying products that probably don't work or almost almost surely don't work that's what it'll take that's what people will do because that that triggered, it's almost like a pre-rational thing. I think a lot of people would probably not be able to explain exactly why they care about these things because it is pre-rational. It's like a threat that, that happens before we get to think through it. And so it's a really, really useful way for, for profiteering companies to sort of get us to buy their stuff. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, it was interesting to me in reading it also was how much power and shame were intertwined with one another. And one of the nice things you do in the book, and we'll talk about this, is take up counterexamples. So you don't just talk about the disadvantaged or the um, people who are often subject to the power of others. But I thought a lot of the examples were sort of of that character, like in a way that was really productive. So you gave this example of Vagisil in, in the book, um, which was, it's an example of in the US, like a product that's marketed to women to, you know, quote unquote, clean their vaginas, except, you know, the very idea of that product that vaginas are dirty and need cleaning is false. There's no, there's no evidence for that at all. And it sort of supports this fantasy of like, you know, women needing to prepare their bodies for the satisfaction of men and women's bodies being problems. There was, there's sort of so much tied up into it. And I thought to myself, like, there is no equivalent product for men. Like there is no product that says, men, your penis and testicles smell, here's a special product to keep them clean and not repulsive. And, you know, we see this frequently actually that, you know, that the marketing is too often like less powerful people or, the shame is placed upon less powerful people. We'll talk about examples where that isn't true, but I'm curious if you could help me understand that. Like, why is it that, you know, the socially marginalized or the less powerful are often the sort of objects of the weight of this shame industry? Well, before I answer that, I, I do want to mention that I think a lot of the products like the ED drugs targeted mostly at older men are kind of similar to that. Um, and I do think it's probably because it's older men and this is the idea of like masculinity is being threatened if like you have ED problems. So, but again, that kind of just supports your point which is that it's like people that are vulnerable um, and they're already, um, what's the word, you know, stigmatized for being older. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, the thing about it is shame is like kind of the oldest thing. Like it's, it's, an, it, Eve got shamed out of the garden of Eden for eating the apple, right? Like, it's like pretty, pretty much like one of those old fashioned notions. Um, and it does tend to, I mean, observationally, it does tend to um, be um, burden. The burden falls on the, on the sort of youngest, weakest, least powerful um, member. And, uh, and, you know, I have a lot of theories about that um, because, I mean, the theory I have, I'll just say quite, quite directly, is that not only is shame used as profit, profiteering, like it's a really, it's a wonderful profit engine, but it also, uh, when it's not profit, 
when you're looking around for like, why is shame like punching down shame happening? I call it punching down when it's, when it's usually when it's directed at powerless people. Um, it's usually just to, to just maintain the status quo. So in some sense, it's almost like a <laughs> closed circuit logically, right? You're saying like, we're going to shame you to, to keep you in your place, to silence you, going back to the earlier point. Um, shame is, and because shame is so de debilitating, you know, socially, it's such a socially de debilitating thing where you feel threatened and contingent, like you're only halfway in to the community. Um, just by being in that tier of, of uh, the outer tier of the community, by being in that shamed position, you don't get powerful. It's almost like, it's almost the same thing, really. You know, when I was reading it, I couldn't help but think um, of Donald Trump. Uh, and, you know, how among sort of commentators in sort of popular media, but also the academy, there was a constant refrain, the man has no shame. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I thought also here in a British context of like, the Brexit and the ways that people described um, Boris Johnson or Nigel as lying without shame in mm. advocating for what it is that they wanted. And here, you know, it, it made me think like, wow, you know, a lot of us thought it would be better if Donald Trump had shame, because then he would have acted in a better way, or it would be better if our politicians we're capable of being shamed and mm -hmm. that the incapacity of some people to, to experience shame creates a host of social problems. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you is like, how can I think through that? How can I think through yeah. the kind of critique that you have of shame with this other discourse about people who are shameless, yeah. which is often an insult or a social problem? Yeah, thank you for that great question. Well, I would say, first of all, that Trump was not at all shameless, continues to not be at all shameless. Um, and in fact, I think shameless is an overused term that I want, I want us to rethink. I want every time some, somebody uses the word shameless, what they really mean, in my opinion, is that this person doesn't share a norm with me that I expected them to share. And they are not, they're not like responding as they, I expected them to, to the shame that I'm trying to target them with over this norm. So just, just to be clear, what I'm saying is that when you shame someone, there's a norm you have in mind. There's a rule they've broken, a norm that, that you thought you shared with them. And you're saying, how dare you don't, you don't follow this rule. And um, the problem with calling someone shameless when they don't agree with a norm is that actually they probably do agree with other norms. They probably have their, a lot of norms they have. Um, there's probably their own notion of community that they really desperately clinging to um, that would, you know, they would derive shame from if they, if they were told that they're not following the rules of that community. So you're, you're kind of acting as if this person has no norms at all that they, they cling to when in fact, it's just one norm that you've located that they don't cling to. So a kind of extreme version of this is like, if I didn't know you, Seamus, and I saw you eating in the subway, which I'm sure you never do, because that would that would be not okay with me. And I'd be like, that person is shameless. But I, of course, agree with you in a lot of ways. And and I don't, you're not shameless, but if you're, you know, make breaking that one rule. So I guess my point is that it's just a very narrow thing that's actually happening, but it's a very broad thing to call someone shameless. Now, to get to Trump in specifically. I think he is shame driven. I think he is like knowing a little bit about his upbringing and his terrible father and, you know, bizarre. I mean, I'm not saying he's a good guy at all, but I'm just saying the guy is deeply shamed. Um, and, and he has a lot of norms that you can just look at. You can, you know, he's worried about being weak. He's worried about being unpowerful. He's worried about being stupid. Um, he's worried about not being rich. So there's all sorts of things that he, completely clearly has norms around um and for that matter like he has empathy do you know how he, he feels really sorry for like he felt really sorry for roger ailes when he got kicked out of fox news like it's always surprises it surprised me and i that people sort of called him shameless when he he was like wearing his shame on his sleeves actually actually but of course there were norms that he didn't follow that were outrageous like democracy and truth-telling 
And those are norms that are so important to us that I think it's reasonable for us to say, like, that guy's beyond the pale. You know, I think it's totally reasonable for us to say, that's a norm that matters so much to me because he's the president <laughs> that, you know, it's unforgivable. Like, I totally agree with that. I'm just saying, like, shameless is the wrong term. I will just finish by saying that, you know, politicians in a lot of ways are you know, there's a selection system, selection bias, I would say, like, there's a huge amount of selection bias to get people who play the game of politics. I mean, I don't know if you've ever considered becoming a politician, Seamus, I think that would be great, but for, great for the country, right, but not for you necessarily, because the actual stuff you have to do and you have to agree to um, kind of selects away from people that are idealistic. And just thinking through that, you'll be, you'll realize that, like, it's a whole different set of norms actually that we're selecting for for politicians and i'm not saying there's no good politicians i'm just saying that you, you just it's really a different world than what we normally are happy, happily interacting in so i'm curious and maybe i should have started here but like you know i think about shame and i think about a lot of other terms that are kind of associated with it as you know as a sociologist obviously stigma which you deal with in the opening but I wanted to focus on one particular word as being maybe distinct from shame, and that's embarrassment. Like, what is the difference between shame and feeling embarrassed? So, you know, I think if I were to go out onto the street and have an accident and pee my pants, I feel like I would experience embarrassment in some ways because it's not a systematic thing. Yeah. Maybe if it were systematic, I would feel shame, but I, can you help me think through the difference between the sort of affective and community level differences between shame and embarrassment? Yeah, I mean, and I, I would say the same thing for like guilt too, like guilt versus shame. Um, it's like you feel guilty about something you did and you feel ashamed about something you are, you know, like, if, and you can, of course, there's a lot of gray area. There's there's ways that you can both feel both, um, but you'd, you'd feel guilty about not recycling like the can, like by throwing it away in the wrong place. Like, it's not like you're like, that makes me a bad person, right? So it's, that's that's where you're going to shame when you're like, it, it reflects on the my actual self. Like it makes, you know, it reflects on whether I'm a good or bad person. Similarly with embarrassment, you can have an embarrassing episode um, like peeing your pants or something. And then the question is, does it turn into shame? It could, it could, if that's something you're like, oh my God, I, that happens to me all the time. It's who I am now. It's like defines me socially. Um, and also if it was like put up on social media, if there's a video of you peeing your pants and if people were like, oh my God, who like, that would, that would be another way for it to enter your identity. So it has to, it has to be touching and tarnishing um, your notion of yourself for it to be a classified as shame as far as I, I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, another thing I was thinking of when I read this um, was this incredible book, um, The Condemnation of Blackness by Khalil Muhammad, which mm -hmm. is um, a book in the US case that shows how social statistics and sociologists, people like me, in the turn of the 20th century transformed criminal acts like crime as something that individuals did to a type of person. Mm. And in particular, they did this for Black Americans. And so what Khalil Muhammad shows in this book is how the social statistics of things like, you know, the gathering of social information about crime rates transformed, you know, individuals who committed crimes into people who were criminals. Mm. And in that book, Muhammad sort of shows how, you know, the Irish committed crimes at roughly the same rate as African Americans did, but Irish people were seen as people who committed crimes and black people were seen as criminals. Mm -hmm. And this was an analogy to me in your book because you sort of bring in your background as someone who's interested in data algorithms, how information gets mobilized to produce this. And so, you know, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit, particularly here from your section on network shame, about how it is that the internet or large corporations or these sort of broader organizations participate in and even facilitate this transformation. 
Yeah, you know, I, I want I want to encourage everyone who hasn't already to read Gary Steingart's book called Super Sad True Love Story, which was written like a long time ago, like before Occupy, but like um, not only predicted Occupy, but also predicted um, the surveillance society we can currently live in. And he had this notion of like um, these, you know, a, a, a credit score, a social credit score that um, actually kind of already exists in China, by the way. <laughs> That's actually another important thing. It was like radically transparent. Um, he even had like uh, people wearing transparent underwear and people like judging each other's like, um, <laughs> it, you know, down there um, and at a bar, like in real time, people's social credit score are going down because they made a bad joke or something like that. It was incredibly shame provoking. And that was kind of the idea. And it was satirical and very funny, but what it, I kept coming back to the super sad true love story because what I realized is that um, th that notion of the social credit score was was actually kind of happening um, silently. So it was like the, kind of the flip of the tra radical transparency. It was like underground, and it was this, this underground sort. Of, and it was not only just it was happening invisibly to the normal human. It was sort of at the level of the you know, data collectors, the third party data collectors that are like Axiom and all those enormous things that the profiling um, in the cloud, like the, our browsing data, like who who's a gambler, who's like, uh, who's who's a felon, you know, who's been arrested, like all the, the terrible things that people can find out about us um, and then store. And it had the other aspect of it, which was that it's um, unlike the sort of very quickly moving notion um, in the Super Sad True Love Story, this had the kind of an infinite um, gestation period. Like it was just always being added to. Um, so my, and of course it was not a true reflection of us, right? Like the point is that it's kind of our digital doppelganger, but it's in some sense like the worst things about us. Um, so I, I, I sort of understood it as a notion of a digital scarlet letter. Um, and I kind of I kind of drew that connection between the Hester print scarlet letter and and the, and this this um, like this secret scarlet letter that we don't really know of uh, know about explicitly, but which nevertheless um, sort of we have to carry throughout our lives. It, in particular, those kinds of um, marks on our record, um, whether they're like evictions or again felonies or just bad habits that we we have according to norms. Um, might prevent us from getting a job, but might certainly might prevent us from getting housing. Um, we probably wouldn't know it was happening. Just to be clear, when you when your record shows that you you have a like a mark on your record and you get sort of denied in an algorithmic sense, you almost never get told why. Um, so I was just I was just realizing that these norms that we're carrying and they don't they don't get, even get updated. They're sort of infinite marks on you, and and sort of they cause you potentially lifetimes of shame that you're not quite aware of, but you must bear the consequences of. You know, I thought you, you used the Scarlet Letter a couple times in the text and Esther Prins or Prime, I don't know how, I think it's, I don't know, let's say Prine. Oh, did I say wrong? Okay, sorry. No, I don't know if you did or I did. I, I'm, okay. I'm, um, oh. We'll we'll just ag agree that it's Esther something. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> it's Hester. It's Hester Prince. Hester. Oh, I didn't even know get her name yeah. right. Um, um, but as I recall the story, which I think I read in middle school or early in high school, it's you know a woman who um, has a child outside of marriage and has yeah. to um, wear an A uh, mm -hmm. on her uh, body at all times, and it really evoked to me sex and sexuality and shame and. Um, as you know, Kathy, like the last few years of my life, I've been writing about sex and in particular sexual assault. Yeah. And there were a few things that it kind of evoked to me. The first was, um, of course, the education that we give young people in sex and sexuality, which yes. is very much about all the terrible things that will happen to you if you have sex. So yeah. here in the United States, it's about you'll STIs, unwanted pregnancies, That's true. you know, and so it's like, it's literally educating you to feel bad about or anticipate all the negative consequences of your sexual desire. And, you know, the same thing is with masturbation or other kinds of things where young kids express their sexuality. And I wondered, 
and then we could, of course, also talk about, you know, the idea of a closet and LGBTQ folks and how yeah. we experience just profound amounts of shame for our sexual desires. I'm curious if there's something about sex and shame, why they, they seem to, to have a cheesy metaphor like, you know, bedfellows in, in a way that um, go together in our society, why sexual desires, these things of intimacy um, are often such sort of lightning rods are ripe for experiences of shame. Well, wow, I would have been asking you that question, to be honest. And I, I would also like just um, just to give me like a couple minutes to think about how to answer that question. I would ask you, because I don't know very much about sex education. And I was wondering, is it, I mean, I think what you're saying is that it's inherently shaming in the US. And I, I certainly I certainly know that extreme examples of that, if you've read the book Pure, which is a, written by a woman who like escaped ev ev evangelical church um, teachings on sexuality. It's just mind blowing, but of course, probably not all that, uh, you know, uh, representative of U.S. Sex, sex ed. I'm wondering, are there countries that do it better as in not as shaming? Yeah. I mean, there are, there are places that do a better job. I mean, there's also because of U.S. federalism, there are states that do better job. And yeah. interestingly, like it's it's actually deeply aligned with inequalities in the United States because um, kids from more well-off families often have access to um, sex ed in private schools and other kinds of things that meet national standards that are sort of established to help young people have a healthier sense of their own sexuality. But I think, you know, a lot of parents, um, you know, do a kind of la, 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 I don't want to hear about yeah, this, yeah. which is inherently shaming, or even the way that we use words. Like, you know, parents will use words like, you know, pee pee and hoo ha rather than penis and vagina. And, yeah. you know, we could kind of think about what it would mean to never say the word elbow, right? Like there was something so <laughs> profoundly shameful yeah. about elbow that we called it your arm fold region, right? Like, because <laughs> we just didn't want you to ever think about it as anything and right. it's always covered up right and so you know there's even this big victorian push that we're still living through where you know that that even even if you think about movies and how they're rated if there's nudity in a movie it's rated r but you can murder somebody right like that's I've never totally understood fine. that i've never understood that and not to mention that you can have tender loving affectionate sex scenes and that's our, but like really violent, nasty, um, maybe sexual things. Like, I just think that's where we need the R, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, anyway, um, look, I think you know more about this than I do. I mean, there are, shame is a big subject. I, um, I didn't touch on a lot of things because the real goal I had of the book was to create what I thought was a useful kind of taxonomy of, of when is shame appropriate and when, and when does shame work? But most importantly, when is there shame? Because, because like, again, like when I, going back to the teachers, like I didn't see it until I had to really think through it. Like it was invisible to me until it wasn't. And I find it really, really helpful to be able to, uh, to recognize it. Um, and then to say, wait, is that, is that punching down or punching up? And wait, is that appropriate? Like overall, is that going to work? What does it take for shame to work? Because one of the dirty secrets of shame is, uh, by the way, dirty secrets, like just, just such a, such a shame dr driven concept, um, is that it feels good to shame people. And that is kind of the, the hijacking that social media does so well to, pro to, to produce such sub shame cycles sh shame outrage cycles and like get us addicted to shaming others so like you know, there's just so many things around it that i wanted us to have a better conversation about shame and now that i now that i've written this book shameless you and i can talk through on uh, many walks in the future I, that i hope we take on like why is sex such a ripe like spot for shame why it and i guess like my first stab at an answer very first stab at an answer is that well, sex, shame is essentially a question of community cohesion and like sex is almost the most important thing about the community, like the, the ongoing community, like how does the community develop? 
who has sex with who else to produce which children, right? So there has to be, there have to be rules around that in any community. So that's probably why that's the first place shame pops up. Yeah, I mean, I love it. I think it's it's pretty similar to what I would kind of say, like you use the word dirty and reflected upon it and it immediately evoked to me. And here's my dorky academic sociologist thing. Mary Douglas has this book, Purity and Danger, that opens with a really sort of like evocative line where she says, dirt is matter out of place. And so things that are mm-hmm. dirty are things that are not in place. Mm-hmm. And what social control is, it, is, it puts the things in place that are not in place. And, you know, shame for sexuality is very much about that kind of social control. There's so much I want to say, but I, I want to like back up because you've used punching up and punching down. And I haven't actually asked you about that yet. And it's really a critical analytic lever that you use in the book, because it's one where you suggest that sometimes shame can be productive, or maybe there's certain kinds of shame we should be much more concerned about than others. And the, the, the device that you use is this idea of punching down versus punching up. And so I wondered if you could just explain that to us. Yeah, thank you. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of invented these notions. I mean, I really stole them from comedy. Um, uh, be, it, and I just tried to retool them a little bit in the context of shame, because I want us to be able to have a better conversation. I want us to be able to say that's punching down and here's why. Um, for me, punching down means you are shaming somebody um, who doesn't have choice or doesn't have voice. Um, and choice, what, what I mean by that is like, remember, you punch, you shame somebody be, with respect to a norm. And the idea is you, you have to make sure that they have the choice to conform to the norm that you're telling them to conform to. So I would argue that poverty shaming, addiction shaming, fat shaming, um, those are not actual choices. Now, people will argue that they are. And and a large part of the uh, the conversation I want to have is is making the case that they are sometimes somewhat uh, a choice, but the the extent to which they are a choice is vastly overrated. And I think it's vastly overrated because people want to shame because it's so useful as a, a mechanism to, to, again, to, to keep themselves away from that particular stigma. So that's the notion of choice. And my, my claim is if you are assuming it's a, let's call it an easy choice. If you're assuming it's an easy choice, but it's not, then it's punching down. The secondary thing is voice. And that means it can mean power. So somebody who's in power almost always has voice. But what I generally mean is like the uh, sort of ability to defend oneself, um, to, to explain why I'm doing this against what seems like the norm, but also the uh, ability to be seen improving, to be seen conforming to the rule. If, if there's like, so be, the sort of right to be tracked, if you will. Sometimes people don't wanna be tracked once they've been shamed. Um, but uh, that's the idea is that like, if you shame somebody who you'll never see again and will not notice if they actually improve their behavior, that's punching down. Um, and, and you can see from those two, those two rules I have, if you will. And by the way, I, I don't claim that they're axiomatically, mathematically perfect, just to be clear. I, I think they're rules of thumb. But you can see that I'm pretty much claiming that almost all social media shame is, is punching down because almost always it's a stranger who you'll never meet again, who you probably will not keep track of, and you're shaming them in a way that they probably can't defend themselves well. There are exceptions though. So the exceptions would be people who have choice and voice, right? Um, so you shame Sarah Huckabee Sanders for lying um, on behalf of President Trump. Um, and that's what that happened at the Red Hen in, uh, in Virginia. Totally appropriate, totally appropriate. She was denied dinner, uh, denied service. And a, a bunch of people went up in arms about it, saying like the end of civility. By the way, civility is often a complaint about what I call punching up shame. Um, like, it punching up shame is is never civil. Like, and by the way, social uh, like all social justice um, campaigns, successful or not, use shame and hopefully use punching up shame. And we're at some point criticized for being uncivil. <laughs> but and 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 I get it. People pe- people like the status quo. They like they like to feel like I I shouldn't have to agree with everything um, that a proprietor of a restaurant believes in in order to be served dinner. And I understand that generally speaking that that is the case. 
But where I really draw the line is when some people were um, people on the right, especially, of course, were claiming that this was tantamount to like how blacks used to be denied service at restaurants. It's not right. So the point is that Sarah Huckabee Sanders was choosing to lie. And she had the so she had the choice, and she certainly had the voice as the spokesperson for for the White House. So just an example, just an example of what punching up versus punching down was would look like. And punching down, of course, when you're denying an entire group of people based on something they cannot control, i.e., uh, you know, the color of their skin, and by almost by definition had no voice in the matter. Um, so it's just really not the same, even though sort of at a very, very shallow level, it might look similar. So I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to give the reader a way of analyzing, like, is this comparable to that? You know, is it really, are those kind of similar or are they very, very different? And I, I, hope, I hope I did that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I really liked, and I said this, I hinted at it before, is how you take on some difficult cases. So um, two examples that pop to mind are, you talk about incels. So for those who don't know what incels are, people who are involuntarily celibate. Um, and, you know, these tend to be, as a category of people, we think of them as like men, primarily white men. And, you know, you know there's pushback on what an incel is because, you know, are you involuntarily celibate because the supermodel that you love refuses to have sex with you? I mean, it may be that there are lots of people who are happy to be in a sexual relationship with you. You just don't want to be in a sexual relationship with those category of people. And so the question of voluntary, but you, you know, you take on that case um, yeah. of a group of people who are tend, can be shamed. And then you talk about um, this woman, this, this case that was really sort of in the news for a while, who, um, uh, she was, I'll just, to, to walk through the example in, in, uh, for those listening along, she was taking her dog for a walk in Central Park and she let her dog off leash and an African-American man came up to her and said, please put your dog back on leash. And he asked her to do that because he was part of a birding community in Central Park and the dogs were disturbing the birds and he was upset about this. And she... Um, called the police, I, I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong in this yeah, story, she Kathy, did. and basically said like, this black man is threatening me. And yeah. Um, yeah. he recorded her doing this and she was, there was a huge social media pylon on her. I mean, yeah. she was, as you pointed out, she was fired from her job and um, she committed, you know, an act that many, myself included, viewed as racist, right? That she'd sort of mobilized police and potentially police violence against a black man who'd asked her to do something that was actually mandated in Central Park. She wasn't allowed to have her dog off leash. And yet at the same time, there was sort of this like, her life became unlivable for a period of time. And so I'm curious, like, how do we think through something like that? Like, we don't want people to be racist, right? And we should call out racism, but maybe our outrage is way out of proportion. Like, how do we how do we navigate our way through that example? Seamus, remind me what the first example is again. And the I, incels. I will certainly the incels, right? Because I wanted to just address that really quickly. Which is that? Thank you for bringing that up. Because this, as I said, I had three goals on this book. Um, to develop this lens of shame, I call it. The first is to recognize shame when it's happening. The second is to say punching up or punching down. I have a little toolkit for that. The third though is to is to ask the question, is this going to work? If I shame somebody, let's say it's it is a choice and they do have the chance to defend themselves. And like maybe they even live with me. Maybe it's my incel son, you know, or it's some my son who's I'm curious, like maybe I'm concerned that they might become an incel. Does it work to shame people? And the answer is maybe not. <laughs> maybe it actually backfires. And and I I think I think we really have to take that quite seriously, especially because we have been trained by social media to shame people, and because it feels good. So it's like already it's dangerous for us to do it at at on a whim. Um, but especially when we're desperate um, to get our our incel son back in line, right? So the question is. Does it work? And and I I think it sometimes doesn't work. And that was kind of my point of the incels is that people who are incels aren't really like 
choosing to be incels. I mean, I guess that in some sense you can, you can imagine that, but I think of it more like they are desperately lonely, very horny. They get, they fall prey to this terrible ideology, which, which is totally wrong, but actually shaming them for that is probably going to drive them deeper into the corner. And I think that's a, that's a, one example I gave, but it's supposed to try to develop this idea that you can, it, by, by shaming someone, which by the way, hurts, right? Even when it doesn't work, that's an important thing to realize. People recognize it as an attempted punch in their gut, as an attempted banishment from their community. So it is very painful, even when it doesn't work, even when the norm is not shared, um, it, it is recognized as a punishment, as an affliction. And so you're, what you're doing is you're suggesting like you are, you're, you're wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're a bad person. And then the, if that person doesn't feel like they can conform, they don't feel heard, et cetera, they're just going to run back to their community and feel further dug in, feel further isolated. And if that's what brought them there, and by the way, the incels are a great example of a community that spent a lot of time figuring out how to dig in further to the community, how to respond to people who try to shame you for being an incel. It's like that's 85% of their work is, to, is those kind of defenses. So my larger point is that like, it doesn't always work. Number one, so to, to figure out, here's my taxonomy for like, you're my instruction guide for like whether I, this is going to work if you shame someone. Number one, make sure it's punching up. Number two, like make sure the norm is actually shared. If you're trying to shame, let's go back to Trump, shaming Trump for misspelling things doesn't work. <laughs> like, like, he doesn't want to misspell things right. There's something in it for him not to spell things right. So don't shame him. Um, but, you know, just make sure the norm is shared. And number three, and this is probably the hardest one, is like you actually have to, you have to be extending that community. You have to be saying like, we're in a community together. Like, I trust you to be a good member of this community. Just you need to change this one thing you're doing wrong. So that's a kind of a trust, a com ongoing community trust thing, which, uh, and this is when we're talking about between two people. Um, when does shame actually work? Those three, three things are required. And then like the exception I have is when you're punching up, like when you're actually in a like social justice um, campaign, like, you know, you talk about the Parkland shooter kids, you know, they, they're they punching up at politicians, like, hey, like make better gun laws. You know, they don't really need to be in a community because they're like holding power to account. So pa holding power to account looks a little different from like, person to person, like healthy shame. Going back to your example of the Central Park stuff, uh, it, you know, I have a couple things to say. And the first one is, I don't think I will ever jump on the shame train of a Karen video. I do consider it punching down because it is not somebody I will keep track of. I do think it's over an overreaction what happened to her. She got fired from her job. It also didn't work on her. <laughs> because I mean, I actually like we because I did the research. I have actually kept track of her because she's in my book. She it is you know suing um, left people left and right for what happened to her. Her life really is ruined, and that isn't reasonable as a reaction to what she did. She made a mistake. I don't agree with her. She made a racist mistake. No, no doubt about it. But I still think that um, it's punching down. Um, no, so. But I, I, I'm not done. I mean, honestly, the thing that I really think about the Karen videos as a genre, if you will, of shame, uh, of viral shame, is that it's aiming too low. It's aiming at um, people who are making use of a racist policing system rather than the racing policing system, racist policing system. I mean, the, the fact that white women, and I'm one of them, if I called if I inappropriately call the police, I summon the police um, to complain about an innocent black man, and I, I would have no, essentially zero concern about myself being arrested. And the black man who I am accusing un unjustly would have a very serious reason to be worried about being arrested. You know, so that's the asymmetry that we should be punching up on. And of course, the that is the that is the the system that is going to be around that that has has the voice. You know what I mean? So if we if we punched up um, 
on this choice of a racist policing system with a voice like that's that's the worthy goal so i, I and that's sort of like the message of the book in general hopefully um, you you agree with me <laughs> that I'm I'm kind of like we need to aim higher. We need to like turn like figure out there is something shameful about all the Karen videos, absolutely. But I think the shameful thing is that it works. That it works to be a Karen, and the idea of shaming um, these people. I mean, I, I will say that it it's an it's happened enough times that it is it's sort of demonstrated what not to do, and I hope that white women everywhere have seen that. So it is it is in that sense useful. I don't want to say there's no utility in it at all. I just think that at some point we have to raise the bar and sort of like say, instead of just knowing that not to do that, what does an actual life of anti-racism look like? So my final question to you, you have gotten at so much and I want to thank you for this conversation is, you know, you, you make this sort of really beautiful and compelling argument about how you know, the Sackler family and, um, you know, OxyContin and these, these drugs profited off um, uh, shame uh, and yeah. how Weight Watchers and other, the weight watching industry profits off shame and how, you know, political parties and political um, policies profit off a logic of individualism and shame. And then you have this second argument, which is sort of about how social media companies can make shame go viral or they can sort of accelerate. It's like, it's not quite a catalyst, but it is sort of fuel for a reaction. And as I was reading this, I thought to myself like, wow, should I get off Twitter and Facebook and Instagram? Should I just not participate in these things? Or is there a way that this sort of new social technology could be handled in a better way so that they're not just shame machines. Um, uh, because I think about like, you know, that I, I think a little bit about like the Gezi protests and how social media was used in part as part of, it was like an intimate part of Arab Spring, which yeah. think of it as you will, you know, it was about a range of information spreading the capacity for organizing, et cetera. And I just, I was like, huh, how should I carry myself as, a person who's on Twitter, a person who uses mm -hmm. Instagram, things like this, or should I think like, actually, these are just corrupted technologies. They're just doing more harm than it's worth. Well, that's a great question. And it's something I grapple with too. I mean, I'm no longer on Facebook, um, but I am still on Twitter and I've never been on Instagram. Um, and this is, I actually managed to be invited to speak to the Senate um, about Facebook algorithms and, and social media algorithms and its effect on such groups as teenage girls and, and the, with respect to their self-image, their body images and stuff like that, but also misinformation, you know, how the algorithms work. And what I, I, a long time ago, I figured out that like those algorithms as I speaking as an algorithmic auditor are too large to audit. Um, they're just, there's too many stakeholders like there's just no way that if I had been hired to audit the Facebook algorithm six years ago, I would have been like, what we need to think about is the Rohingya in Myanmar. Like I just wouldn't have figured that out. Um, in some sense, so, and they are completely out of control and there's gonna be elements of chaos um, and, and just th that's just the nature of them. And that might mean they should be turned off. That might mean that, but at the very least, what it does mean is that we should think of specific types of stakeholders that are at risk and 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 require that the social media companies address the harm that is inflicted upon those people. And I do think, you know, certainly, um, you know, suicide ideation of teenage girls because of you know beauty filters on Instagram is a great example of that. Um, I also, though, do think that this idea of like the piling on viral uh, sh shame tweets and 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 Facebook posts and et cetera, et cetera, are another thing that needs to be addressed because it is really unhealthy for us and it really divides us. The algorithm in general is optimized to make us fight. It might as well be like that. Might as well be an actual encoded in intention. Um, and that needs to be that means needs to be addressed. Um, it is harder than it sounds to to do that, but it's not impossible. I mean, actually, 
they did that and Zucker, Zuckerberg turned it off because it was losing them money. So you know that it's possible. I will just, I, will, I don't wanna let it us stop talking though without saying that like, I think the more direct and very, very doable um, changes that we could make if we had this political will would be to restructure the inherent shaming mechanisms of things like the welfare system and, and prison, which are, if you look through my book, I have this notion of a dignity violation, which is very, very related to like a shaming design. And if you look at the list of dignity violations, which is a notion of Donna Hicks, um, you will see that they are embedded in the very structure of our prison system. They're embedded in the structure of our welfare system. Those design choices can be, can be changed probably faster and more directly than what we can do on social media. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it did. And, you know, unfortunately, it's all we have time for. It's always so great talking to you. I can't wait to sort of continue the conversation. For those who are watching along, I hope that you can join in. Um, um, first of all, get a copy of the book, Kathy's book, The Shame Machine. It's a really wonderful read. It made me think, as you can tell, about so much. And you can find the details of how and where to get it um, uh, in the chat and on the RSA events, social media. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you all of you for watching. Um, uh, uh, it was wonderful. Thank you, Seamus.